Good morning, everybody. So uh, thank you for inviting me to give the keynote uh, uh, call. I'm, I'm very proud to be in uh, services. Um, today I will talk about microservices um, and how it relates to digital health. So uh, it is not exactly the microservices software architecture that's deviating from uh, SOA, but it uses a lot of the, metaphorically, it uses a lot of the sort of advantage of that, of that model. So um, I will go first over the uh, landscape of uh, digital health. What is digital health? How is it evolving? And uh, how would that relate to this conference? And then I will go over some evidence to show you that digital health actually works. It's not something that's just a, a cool technology. It is something that is solving problems. And then I will go next to look at the promise of microservices in particular for digital health. <clears throat> and then we'll go over uh, two types of microservices. The first is microservices for health IoT, where the smallest service possible is just simply a device, a sensor. So for, at that level, microservices is helpful. And then I'll go to the next level, which is microservices enabling new delivery models for healthcare. And that's really the crux of this talk, is focusing on this. Then I will uh, talk about some challenges and impediments to apply microservices in digital health before I conclude. <coughs> so. <coughs> digital health uh, come to implement or support many things such as personal health, active and healthy living, active and healthy aging, uh, delivery of uh, health and social care, and also Digital health can be used to implement what's called learning health systems. Uh, it's a setting in which we try to get data, uh, have a conjecture, and analyze the data, and learn from it, and go back to, uh, to sort of uh, modify our conjecture, or our hypothesis, and learn some more. That's called learning health systems. Um, digital health is most applied uh, uh, in a way that's guided by what's called the determinant of health. So if we look at the determinant of health here, we see that <clears throat> medical care actually determines only a small slice of our well-being. That's if you go to the doctor or you ignore your problem, you don't go to the doctor, that's the medical care you get. It is responsible for only this. Genetics and biology, how you are born, also play, play of course, a big chunk. But if you look at the vast section of that uh, pie. You see here environmental, individual behavior, social circumstances. This is a huge, a huge area, and that determines your health. How you behave, your lifestyle determines your health. How you socialize, are you socially isolated? Do you live in a socially rich environment? That determines your health. And also the environment, are you living in a polluted area, noisy area? Are you living in an area that uh, it, you know, has got traffic, you just get your blood pressure going every time you come home because of fighting traffic, all these things add up. So this is basically where we have application for digital health and we should help. Of course, digital health also help in delivering the care, going to the clinic, also digital health, health can help you. So that's like sort of the scope of digital health. So what we try to do with digital health is very simple. The first is to try to change behavior. Go right to that area, individual behavior and social engagement. If we do something here to change people's behavior, if we're able to do that from sedentary and from uh, sort of irresponsible uh, drug abuse, food is drug as we all know, so if we're able to convert that into that picture, then we've done something good. Also, if we uh, deliver health differently, the way we do health now is we go to the doctor, or get hospitalized. That's where we are. Go to the, we wait, we live, uh, we get a problem, go to the doctor. If we are able to change this in where we do several things such as uh, get health data out, use wearables, and get some health data out, uh, and now we we'll allow doctors to treat us in a different way. So yeah, you can still go to the doctor, but these doctors have appointments from 8.30 till two o'clock, from two to five, they don't have individual appointment. They go to this big data room, and basically they treat people using their digital case. 
their data case. Treat 187 people for three hours collectively. That's cohort population health, and it is rising. But it's not applied, it's not mainstream, but that's where we need to go. If we really have reliable data, continuous data coming in, we should be able to treat people, not just by meeting them when they ask for appointment. We should be able to treat them in that modality. Doctors go to a room and are treating a region collectively. And, and the scale here is huge because five doctors treating 187 uh, people in three hours, looking at the data, deep data, constant data that's coming in, that's something new and that's something that's gonna make a difference. The second is patient engagement and self-care. That's where the patient themselves are caring for themselves. And uh, I borrow here, of course, uh, from my colleague Ramesh Jain. Professor uh, uh, Jain coined the term health navigation. Brilliant coining because it showed that it's not just getting data, but it's getting the cues, like exactly GPS navigation. In the next 100 feet, turn left. You blindly turn left. Even if there is a wall there, you're going to hit the wall because the GPS tells you to turn left. So you trust the system and you actually use the cues. So that's health navigation. So part of changing the delivery model is to let people care for themselves. People are very smart, but they need empowerment. They need guidance. They need health navigation. The third modality is to unleash the power of communities referred to as community resiliency. So uh, community resilience is defined as uh, is a sustainability of a community to utilize available resources to respond to, withstand, and recover from adverse situations. That's community resilience. So if we consider health issues to be adverse situations, then uh, community resiliency comes as a solution to do things. People care for themselves. I will talk about how that is not a new concept, how that is very old. In fact, the oldest such concept was implemented here in Italy. I'll talk about it in a, in a few slides later. Okay, so uh, practically speaking, we can look at digital health from three perspectives. The first one is health navigation, as I mentioned, personal health and wellness, patient engagement, getting people engaged, empowerment, e-coaching, behavior change, and also democratized healthcare. By that we mean empower people to be in charge. Right now you buy a device, the device tells you you have to download the app, the device and the app own you and the company own you and your data is owned by a company. And if you have several conditions, you start getting these stove pipes, app, 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 and then basically uh, you have to sort of uh, figure it out. You have to manage all this data. You don't own it. It's up in the cloud in different spheres. You have to visit every sphere to look at your, uh, your data. It's one person, but multiple silos. So that's crazy. That's not democratized. That's not good. So how can we turn things around? So many people are working on, on a sort of initiatives to turn this around where you own the data and uh, where you own the apps, and when, where you are able to actually merge these apps, even build your own app as a consumer, because it's your health. We have to make it easy. So a lot of work is happening in what's called democratizing health. That's health navigation. Digital plumbing, that's a new concept that's emerging. That is the hottest thing going on right now, as far as I'm concerned, where I spend a lot of time is uh, as Professor Sean mentioned that I work in smart homes. That's like the next thing after smart home is digital plumbing. Uh, and that's healthy places, smart home, healthy communities, healthy new towns, uh, promoting active and healthy living and aging. How can we build homes, communities, where when you build them, you put some plumbing in, you put electricity, water, pipes, but we need to put the digital plumbing from the start. By design, health has to be built in at the lowest level so that we are not going to sit down and keep doing cute experiments, smart home, like the one I had in Florida. That's a cute experiment, but that's just what it is. It's nothing else. So uh, as I will show you later, building smart homes is, is a bad idea. Experimenting with it is a great idea, but um, we need to move on to the real thing, and, that's real plumb uh, and that is digital plumbing. Finally, digital health as a service, which I will explain in the rest of my, of my talk here. If, this is how I look at digital health. Health navigation, 
digital plumbing, and digital health as a service. <clears throat> so again, plumbing means smart home, but it's just the right way of doing it. A key digital health priority is spelled out this way, and there's agreement among uh, many stakeholders, including uh, European Union uh, health program, the Horizon 2020. This text, you will find it in many places, seem to be a consensus that the, the main goal for digital health is to transform the current reactive care system, which is a point of care paradigm. Point of care, because you wait again, and you croak down, you go to the doctor, you get fixed. That's a point, point, point. It's a point of care system, and it's reactive. So we want to transform that from being a, a reactive system to um, a health, to a proactive health navigator. Proactive health navigator, which is a continuum of care as opposed to point of care, capable of providing personalized and timely guidance and just-in-time interventions, while availing real-time individual and population health informatics or information to the people themselves and to health care organization, government, policymaker, and whoever else is involved. So if we're able to just do this, we have covered a lot of territories. So it's good to have at least um, what is the highest priority, what do we need to achieve? So many things can be done in digital health, but this is, this is high priority item in the agenda. So digital health is not just talk, it is there. We actually have products and services available in the market today. So this is Cardia, and basically there's a, there's a missing eye here, I apologize. Cardia is, give you an ECG, uh, it tests for atrial fibrillation, and uh, it does screening for heart rate and others. And it come up on that beautiful device, and also it has a wearable uh, form factor. Apple Watch does the same. These are good uh, products. Who is to say that a person can get an ECG just by touching something in his pocket instead of getting calling a doctor, doctor coming at home? So we're coming out of age here. Things are different. You can you can get ECG done for your entire family when you visit them, for any of our coworkers, just in a playful way. People put their, their, their hands on that device or their fingers on that device. You get an ECG. You are able to see if there's any problem or not. 50% of AFEP patients are undiagnosed. That's a fact. 50% of the people who are suffering from atrial fibrillation don't know that they have that. So imagine just improving screening by these simple devices. They go a long way. Here is another digital health product, and that is the cap of the inhaler. So this is the inhaler jacket, that is the inhaler itself, and that's a cap. That cap uses Bluetooth low energy, similar to what uh, uh, Dr. Jacketian, an ex-student, he works on Bluetooth low energy, these kind of simple devices. So everybody's taking an inhalation anywhere, it goes to the phone, and from the phone go to a national service. So doctors wake up in the morning, uh, you know, they wake up like everybody else, have coffee with their wives, turn on the TV, and they see the weather map. But the do these doctors, allergy doctors, will also quick click and quickly find out allergy map. They know what's coming ahead, because everybody who inhales will, will have a point in that map. Such a powerful concept. Okay? So in places like there's an allergy valley in Tennessee, it's really difficult valley with a lot of uh, adverse uh, patients having adverse uh, uh, experiences. Finding these details are very important. This is Propeller Health. Another simple product is simply Open Notes. Many people may have heard of it, but Open Notes is actually powering a lot of people to see what's happening. When you go to the doctor, you go home, the doctor just keep telling you what to do. By the time you go home, you forgot everything he said, or you don't remember everything. So whatever he says can be in Open Notes. Many big hospital organizations started to adopt uh, open notes, which is actually an open source. It's, a, it's more of an initiative. And now even, even the, the largest hospitals are using it. So that's a great thing to democratize the data and to get the data out to the patient. And, and I do not think it's high tech, but it's very important. It's data. So I consider it to be a digital health product. OK, do we have evidence digital health work? Yes, we do. I'll just show you a simple example here. This is Liverpool Connected Health Study. Liverpool is one of the worst, um, is the, the most unhealthy, one of the most unhealthy spots in the United Kingdom. Um, 
sedentary, overweight, over half of the population is overweight, 26% have COPD. <laughs> it's stark statistics. You can read this, you won't believe it. 68% uh, 68, 68 of the population are not active at all. So I don't understand why that is, but my guess is because they have a very nice football team, Liverpool, <laughs> where Musala plays, and maybe that's why it is. You just sit down and watch football all day long. But uh, anyway, it is one of the really uh, inflected areas in the United Kingdom. Phillips Healthcare stepped in and said, let's do a long-term study. Let's see if digital health will make a difference here. And they simply used very uh, primitive technology. Simple vital measurement device, like this is, this is a blood pressure monitoring device, uh, and something uh, called uh, Motiva, which is nothing but a sit-up box. The sit-up box hook up to the TV, so there's a communication through the TV. Something very simple. This is the simplest of digital health you can ever think of. And they use it for, for some time, and look at what the results are. 60% less paperwork, 29% more patient face time, but this is really the statistic, the statistic that's powerful, which is 35% decrease in hospital admission. That's huge. When you have 26,000 patients that regularly get admitted, and you're saving 35% of that, that's significant uh, bill to slash. That's amazing savings. 53% drop in a &E, ambulatory, meaning emergency services. Half, it went down half. 59% hospital bed days. So, so they reclaim 60% capacity of the hospital to care for other people. These are COPD uh, patients who have uh, uh, heart conditions where uh, they have sort of recurring issues and, and many complications. But just keeping tab on, the, on that disease uh, as, it, at, as you live with it and finding these vitals and reacting in time, again, the just in time that we talked about. It's a, it's, a, it's a continuum of care, just in time intervention, create all these savings. So this is a very large scale study. It proves beyond any doubt that when you move into that space, everybody wins. Governments win, uh, people win, hospital wins, everybody will be happy. We also have evidence that uh, digital health is picking up. So here is the... Uh, the revenues of digital health in the United States, in Europe, in Asia, and then the rest of the world, and that's how it's growing. So this is a growth rate, CAGR, almost 50% in just five years. That is telling. In five years, you're having 50% growth as you start. So this is going to be a huge economy. In fact, I look at uh, digital health, and particularly health navigation, to be something that will mimic the evolution to mobile phone when the GSM came and where uh, companies like Nokia, you know, they, they moved into that space and uh, brilliantly created the whole economy, a renaissance per se. And that's where you take advantage of some disruptive technology. I think health navigation will be the next thing or one of the next things after uh, mobile phone. It's just what people want and that's where government wants uh, to save some money. Now let's move on to digital health as a service. The use of service and microservice to enable many needed integrations. Most notably, integrating health and social care. When you start getting into integration, integrating mental and physical health, integrating primary and specialized care, integrating social health and social care, all these integrations are challenging. And microservices comes to help that integration, make things happen, make it easy, okay. It's, it's almost akin to the same software microservices concept the same, in the same way. The flexibility, the, the neutrality of the implementation, you can have microservices in any language, same thing. So the nature of the microservice can change without changing the process itself. So microservices come to help. What is sought here is flexibility in the implementation uh, of care pathways, many of which are overlapping and intertwined. So if you look at a COPD patient, uh, he goes to the doctor, but he goes to, uh, or she goes to many other services. These services are used for asthma. So it's, it's not like uh, it is con uh, verticalized. You have highly overlapping services, and that's also where microservices come to help. 
So I will talk now about two things. The first one is how to apply microservices on the first element, which is health IoT, the Internet of Things for health, health IoT. Second, I will talk about enabling new and direly needed care delivery models in integrated health and social care setting, something that everybody wants. How can we enable it? So uh, I would not want to go over all this, but these are examples of various um, integration, as I mentioned to you. Okay. So, um, if we look at the main goal for microservice is to ensure measurably better outcome, lower cost, high quality, personalized and seamless delivery of integrated health and social care, inclusive of patients and community engagements. That definition is a European uh, Union, European Commission uh, definition uh, in, in their health programs. So we want technology that enable this. So I see microservices to fill exactly that shoes. Ensure measurably better, it's almost everything, you want everything here, the whole enchilada. Ensure better outcome, lower cost, at a lower cost, high quality, personalized and seamless delivery of integrated, in, right there, integrated is demanding, integrated health and social care, inclusive of patient and community engagement. So now you wanna have also the engagement kick down. Too much to ask for. So microservices for integrated health and social care service will be um, useful because it, it, it better coordinate the care pathways. There's a way to coordinate using microservices, as I will show in the next slides. Uh, it removes, it, it has a, a good opportunity to remove inefficiencies and reduce unit and total cost, minimize potential patient frustration and quality of service issues. Okay. Now I go to the first uh, such microservices, which is health IoT. So, <clears throat> In 2006, uh, I was at the University of Florida, and we thought of how can we create um, uh, a standard, a service-oriented device architecture, SODA. At that time, we call it SODA, service-oriented device architecture that enable uh, devices and simple things to be used exactly in the way we, we, we articulated before, in many different pathways. Um, flexibly and so forth. So we came up with a standard called SODA. IBM was very kind to trust uh, the academicians and the University of Florida and others. They actually moved us to uh, Cali, where they have the Emerging Center Group. They're very open, and I give them credit for that, because the, the last thing you want to do as a company is to d invent the standard yourself. You want to get stakeholders and trust them. And uh, at that point, IBM trusted SODA, and we tried to launch it. And it failed. But that's exactly what you do with standard. If it failed, then it failed. And then you leave it there. It failed for reasons. Um, it's just the time was wrong. But it was about this exactly. It's coming now again. It's creating microservices out of these um, health IoT devices. So to explain SODA, uh, I'll use this example here. Imagine that first you go to, let's say, a home. And then you drop three medical devices, three IoT things placed in the smart house. You power them up and you leave that space. And then you go somewhere else and you, let's say, just to take the metaphor, using an IDE like Eclipse. You start up Eclipse and you tune into a project. That project now is a smart home. So now the Eclipse is not a development environment. It becomes also a, a runtime environment, RTE. You go there and uh, you browse these devices. You see them and then you can do things with them. Then these are microservices. Because now, they are no longer devices, they are pieces of software with their own implementation, their own resources, their own database, their own everything. And now you're able to put them into an application. Until you go to that IDE, there's nothing going on in the smart space. It just have devices, but it's application-less. Now you can do anything, you can create application one. Tomorrow morning, you can change it to application two, and so forth. So that's how, uh, to, I'm just trying to describe to you quickly what is the uh, microservices uh, under health IT. Of course, at that time, we're struggling because how do you do that? Uh, market is fragmented. There were a bunch of standards. Econet was uh, one of the things. 
OSGI with another. Uh, we created SODA as, a, as an answer or as a standard. And that's uh, to explain to you how SODA is done. This is uh, a device, a sensor, and that's how you describe the sensor using a language called DDL. And once you describe it, then we use that description to generate the microservice. And at that time, we can, um, we can market our idea and say, OK, it is um, integrate once, program everywhere. If integrate once, program everywhere. So if you get any device, you integrate it into a microservice once. From that point on, you don't have to worry about that device. It's a microservice already. So deploy everywhere using microservice architecture. And uh, this is uh, the blood pressure monitoring device. Also, you uh, integrate it in the same way. I don't show, show it's DDL. It's, more, it's bigger. And uh, that was done using a project called Atlas Thing Architecture. That is an adapter that takes any hardware, takes its DDL, and generate that microservice bundle. So microservices are great, but I need to uh, also disclose to you some of the problems of microservices uh, in the health IoT space. So it has blesses, but it has two, two curses. The first is that microservices overpromise. It overpromises an elephant for an ant. It, you know, it looks like a micro, you can just use the service, help yourself. But in reality, there is a small device, minimal energy, uh, low bandwidth, uh, all kind of sort, or, or, or also uh, bad data. <clears throat> because the fact that you have a medical device doesn't mean the data coming out of it is perfect. In fact, the, the cardia example I showed you, where people take uh, their ECG by themselves, uh, that company is brilliant because they figured out it's not enough to have the device. You have to make the device sentient of how it's being used. You have to have a, a feedback loop with the user as the user is using the device. So when you put your fingers to try to, to get, take your ECG, the first thing that happens is a metaphor pops up. And that metaphor is the wireless signal. Like you have a good signal or bad signal on the phone. So people understand that metaphor. So they put that signal quickly, and it's orange. And it has to turn green, and it has to tell you strong, strong signal. And now you are placing your fingers correctly, and now the data is real data. Otherwise, it's actually noise. It's, it's junk. So you have to you see all this. So um, these devices have all kind of limitation, again, uh, including how they're being used. So you cannot just um, put something that looks like an elephant, but it's actually an ant. So things will go wrong somewhere else. So that's the thing. It overpromises microservices, overpromises in health IoT. Microservices also is too powerful to be safe. Now that you have microservices, guess what? Programmers are very good as, at the monkeying around. You can sit down and create a kind of programs, but logically the programs will create hazard or wrong. So uh, monkeying around is a big problem. Creating bugs is a problem. So it's too powerful to be safe. Things can go wrong. We need something else. So um, we need like uh, IoT transactions, some way of creating transactions that provide guarantees how things are happening, uh, virtual sensors, all sorts of stuff. It, it reminds me with, uh, when we were kids, we go to the, the fun park, you get to that car, and uh, you're as a kid, you're, you can turn a million times, but, but the car will not turn a million times. And you can go flat out, but it's not gonna go uh, 100 miles an hour, okay? It has limiters. Lim these limiters are nothing but runtime environment. It's constrained, set on the runtime environment, so whatever you do, the runtime environment kicks in to provide safety for the child. Same thing here. So um, microservices is not safe, but the follow-on research that has been happening try to address that issue. You know, create transaction, create this uh, runtime constraint, and so forth. Okay, now I'll show you how uh, health IoT using microservices was utilized in the smart house. Um, that's what uh, uh, Professor Carl Chang referred to. Uh, the, the Gator Tech smart house is in a retirement community in Gainesville, Florida. Yeah, it's just a regular house, but it was built from scratch to be a smart house, uh, and that was my first experience with how to do these kind of things. That's how the house looked like, regular house. You walk in, dining, uh, reception, kitchen, kitchen nook. That is a bedroom suite, and so forth. And I need to point to one more thing. 
that was a garage. It has a car, and it wasn't used as a regular garage. It was used as a driver simulator. Why? Because elder driving was a huge problem. Huge problem. People kill themselves in Florida because they are not giving up the keys in time. So that's a big problem. But notice I say it was. It's no longer a problem. The problem magically vanished. And I'll get to that in a minute here. So it's, it's good to hear that, that the problem has ended. That's fantastic. This is the team that did the work. Uh, my team is down there. Uh, barely had two girls, two women in the team, so we're still struggling with the gender issue in the engineering. Uh, but that's an interdisciplinary team that did this, uh, that, that built the house and ran it. Uh, this is my colleague, Bill Mann, and I were running that project. And the community, you can see here one person, Manette Hendler. She was helping us test the house. Many enthusiasts come to test. And uh, I'll just give you two examples of where we used microservices in the house using Atlas. So one is a smart wave. That's a microwave oven where uh, you bring in the food packet close to it. Then it talks to you and tell you what's going on, give you instructions, reminders, so you don't have to uh, sit the microwave oven and attend to all kind of mundane things, especially gourmet packets that takes three cycles, two cycles, or three cycles. It's a chore, so it does it all for you. And this, the second example is the smart floor, and the smart floor is basically where you are able to count steps to understand activity level, the person active, barely walking today. You just get a number at the end of the day. When you get a number that falls below a threshold, you can start texting the son, the daughter, so you're getting the, the society to understand when to, to pay attention to things. So very simple application. These were done using microservices. Okay, so we've done the smart house, but we learned something, that uh, you don't really build smart houses. It's the wrong thing to do. So you need to do digital plumbing. And so that's, I'm going to talk about this quickly. I moved to England two years ago, and the main reason I moved was uh, they gave me a lot of money, of course, so <laughs> I take that. But, but also, uh, that project was the attraction. And the attraction is um, National Health Service, NHS, has uh, the vision or the aspiration to create healthy new towns, they call them. Uh, some of them are green grass, some of them existing community. I happen to fall into a green grass. So this is a completely green grass, meaning you know, it's, this is the intimidation part. They're like, okay, you have got no excuse. This green grass. Build it, show that there are significant health outcome differential. Show that you take all the boxes. You do that at less unit cost, less total cost. People are happier. People are healthier. The whole bit. So now we have to, no excuse, so we have to do it. But it's difficult. There is nobody who wrote a book before. Uh, you cannot go to Amazon and find how to build a healthy new town. It doesn't exist. So what do you do? You just uh, co-create and spend enough time to learn, make mistakes, and just try to build it up. At the end, maybe we can write that book. But it's really difficult. But it's very honorable. It is the kind of thing you don't mind erring on and doing all kind of failures because it's honorable to try to, to work at that scale. So it's much bigger than a smart home. That's where I learned, and that's where I coined the term digital plumbing. So the, <laughs> after one year of working, I realized it was a mistake. No, no smart home. I cannot build a dementia home because I'm not sure who's going to buy it. I don't know the buyers yet. How can you build a dementia home for someone who doesn't need dementia? But I want a home that if I want to turn into a dementia home, I should be able to do that exactly as how I bought this jacket yesterday. Walked in a store because I forgot my jacket in the plane, and they just fit me and they personalize it very quickly, and they send it to my hotel room. So if somebody's buying a home and it needs to be a dementia home, or if somebody buys a home and three years later he needs it to be or she needs it to be a dementia home, we should be able to do this in a whim, quickly. So we need to create smart ready homes, not smart homes. Smart ready homes, not smart home. And therefore the entire pressure now is off my chest. The entire pressure goes to the builders. And we need to now market to them and brainwash them and convince them. There is something called digital plumbing. And these architects and these builders look at me like, we never heard that term before. So you haven't? Seriously? Digital plumbing. So we, we try to brainwash them. They figured it out. We're trying to brainwash them. 
but they understand now what's at stake. They understand it's a huge market. They are uh, on board with us. Uh, they are a very great uh, group of people working with us to try to find out what is the absolute minimum digital thing that needs to be in a home so that you can turn it without renovation projects into a specific smart home. So that's just a, a quick explanation. This Windai Garden Village consists of 1,400 homes or units. It's green grass. It has a health center. It has um, can't see it here for some reason, but it has a health hub, meaning it has a community hub for social gathering and all that stuff. It has a school, and everything has to be different. Even the school has to be different. No vending machine in the school, because kids should not have sugar. This and that. So it's, everything is done to our discretion. Uh, there is a city council that's sitting uh, overseeing this project, uh, and that city council will create the tax code to fund many of the things, many of the services, because you have to think, who's gonna put stuff? Who's gonna put RFID reader in the, on the roads? Well, the county put the road. When you tell the county you need every light pole now has to have an RFID reader, they have to ask, oh, how do I get my money back? So that go back to taxes. So it's an integrated project, a lot of stakeholder. It's not just technology. The last thing you wanna imagine is this is only technology. It's, it's beyond that. So um, in the area where the, smart, where the, gate, where the Wind Eye Garden Village is, we have these statistics. One in three children is obese. 36,000 people, uh, or 36,000 deaths can be actually um, prevented, and it's due to physical inactivity. 36,000 in that re region, in the, in the Lancashire, South Cumbria area. So we, we came up with, and here is the money spent on obesity and diabetes alone. These are lifestyle diseases. The, the, the bill for solving this problem or just treating problem, and still eventually people die, is uh, much more than the police, the fire department, and the judicial system all combined. This is a huge bill. And so this is some of our agenda of what we need to do. <coughs> plan integrated health services. So that's where we want to learn from the Ecosti project in Finland. So that's what we try to do here. So this is great that you have, you are with us here, uh, uh, Penti, appreciate your coming. <coughs> and metrics of success, I already mentioned that, reducing unit total cost, patient satisfaction, scalability, and sustainability. Meaning, if we build this Windai Garden Village, and we still need the same number of physicians to treat um, the, uh, the, the citizen of that city, we haven't done anything. The ratio has to change. We need to use much less pay, uh, physician to treat the same number of patients. So it's not just health outcome. It is a, the delivery system itself has metrics. Okay, I already mentioned that. It's a bad idea to build smart homes. Um, we should move into creating smart radio homes when I explain why. Okay, I want to move faster here and uh, just to talk about the community engagement. So again, I bring back the definition of community resiliency, which is the sustainability of a community to utilize available resources to respond to and withstand, recover from adverse situation. <clears throat> so in Windhoek Garden Village, uh, we look at the concept of Uber of digital health. We look at transportation, we look at being part of microservice implementation by the health and social care systems, like the ECOSTE e-services, we look at the community to be part of that. We need the community individually and as a whole to participate in their own health care, uh, health and social care delivery. How do we do that? Well, I'll show you in a second, but the kind of technology we'll be using is mobile apps, what's it called, the tech shop will be in Windhoek, the tech shop will do, will, 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 will do a lot of magic because you need to get the technology uh, issues out of the, of the loop. You know, we don't want anybody to, be, to not have access. We don't want anybody to feel at loss of installing anything. So you have the tech shop dedicated in the town to take care of this. Um, mediation technology, which is a crowdsourcing platform, and integration into the nearby uh, integrated care systems. So Windike will sit uh, in between two sort of uh, uh, clinics, integrated care systems. So normally people will just simply make appointment and go there, but now we have the chance to hook up these two integrated care systems into Windike in different ways, 
to have connected health and so forth. So um, that's when we say integration into the nearby uh, integrated care systems. Now let, let me just give a little bit of history about community resiliency and participation of the community in its own health. Not far from here in Florence, there is actually a, a living example, which is a Benarc della Misericordia di Firenze. Some of you here speak Italian, will say that better than me, and, but that's what it is. So this is uh, the oldest brotherhood for the care of the sick and the oldest private voluntary institution that remained to be active since its inception in the 14, 14, uh, 1244. That's amazing. So this is where a community came together to try to care for itself. Its lay members called brothers still continue to provide part of the infirm transport service. Infirm transport service, they move people around for emergencies to a doctor and so forth. Take somebody to go get, buy food and return them back and so forth. So this exists today. You can see more information in uh, Wikipedia. The way this was funded was um, at that time, the rich people uh, in Italy here, they had the chance to sort of uh, redeem themselves from any and all sins before they die. So if somebody getting sick before they die, they will go on so that people don't know who they are, they will cover and they will put the money. That's how they fund this organization. And uh, it doesn't matter. You, you know, if, if that's what it is, that's how it started. And today, if you actually go to Florence, and if you go to the dome, they actually located next to the dome, and this is their car, unmistaken car, you can see it. 1244, and it's still around today. So that community resiliency is a real thing. We're not gonna stand here to invent it, but we're just trying to see in which way we can now bring it back, in a way. So um, you don't have to sin uh, to to participate, IBM uh, did a study uh, with the University of Florida, which is called participatory health. Uh, all you need to do is to just have a social media account. You, sins or not, you can just participate. So if you have any social media account, we, IBM created technology where they are able to include social media gadgets, let's say on Facebook, so that you're doing your social media and just wasting time or killing time, and these social media gadgets pop up to you. And, um, you know, uh, Mr. Carl, um, tell us about your neighbor, uh, John Smith. Is he, do you see him, is he active? Just a simple thing. And Carl says, yeah, I see him all the time, he's good. Boom, return. And he continued to surf. It's just a simple net, network effect. That can say something about uh, patients. So now you, you create human sensors. You're getting the community to sense itself and to care for itself. That, that project was very successful with IBM. Uh, I don't know if it went into real products or not, but Florida was participating in it. Just an example of how a community uh, can care for each, for each other. But, but there is also the emergence of crowdsourcing as a serious business, not as acute research, uh, and that's Uber. So we know the Uber and how Uber was a great technology, but now Uber also realized its own strengths and created Uber Health. And Uber Health, they focus on transportation, exactly what that a uh, Ferenzi organization was doing, so, but now they, they make business out of it. There's money involved. And the guys who work on Uber Health are a little bit different from the regular drivers because they have to get through training and uh, sensitivity training and many other things. Handling, the car has to have certain equipment. Handling a patient, bringing him into, into the car, inside the car and out the car, so there's some training. But guess what? The driver is no nurse. The driver is not a physician. But the driver here in Uber Health is filling a little bit of a slice of the care chain by bringing the patient. Wonderful. That's great. So that, I saw this, I couldn't believe it until I had to find that man who's running uh, Uber Health. Now I go talk to him and I tell him, what else? So for, for reason I don't know, he didn't share with me. Maybe they don't have the aspiration, but I doubt it. I'm sure they do know, but they're not doing more than just transportation at that time. But you can imagine now going to a patient, administering a urine sample, taking the urine sample, delivering it to the hospital. Now you can imagine many things. And if you move into the uh, older population, you have what's called the activities of daily living. Tons of activities of daily living. Those can be Ubered as well. Even if you just want a candy bar at night, you should be able to say, I want a candy bar, and you get it. 
and there is cost to it, small cost, but you get your candy bar. But having to wait for a week to, to get somebody at your home to help you when you are uh, aging, or twice a week, and we call that home services uh, on aging, that's ridiculous. That has got to stop. People deserve better than this. They deserve exactly as you go out and get you an Uber taxi to come pick you up, uh, they deserve anything. Cook me a meal, help me, I need bathing, I need help. But how can you bring a stranger to help you bathing? Oh, that's, that's the crux of it, that's, these are the challenges. But, but we have to think that way. So services is gonna help. And services will not only be health IoT, it will involve humans in the loop. But Uber had a good start. So um, we'll have to wait and see what they do. We envision uh, services to be part of the digital health agenda, as I mentioned from the start. So um, there will be service demand and service provision. So the patient can say, I need someone to go to buy me food. I need someone to cook me a specific meal. Whatever, what? I need to make an appointment. I need to see a doctor. I need, I need a doctor video link right now, or the soonest. These are all services from the patient. But from the care system, the care system can also do the same. A nurse can say, I need urine sample for Mr. Smith. And now that demand that you issue in a McKesson system, her information system in the hospital, usually go in a workflow. Now the workflow can be changed. That's where the integration is with microservice. That integration can issue a request. Mr. Uh, Frank is a new retiree. He's capable. He's sitting home. His phone rings. He looks at it. And he sees there's a request to go to Mr. Smith. He say, I take it, and now he got the job. He go to Mr. Smith, greet him, uh, reduce his social isolation, talk to him a little bit, administer that sample, and take it to the hospital. He's retiree. He now make a little bit of money, similar to an Uber driver, and uh, the healthcare system saves tons of money because it's done that way, and the problem is solved. And Mr. Smith didn't have to go through the agonizing trip of ordering a community bus, getting on the bus go to the hospital, standing in line, sitting down, he needs to go to the bathroom. Um, he go to the bathroom, the nurse come out, he's not there, and so forth. This is crazy, madness. The community has enough strength to take care of itself. So we want to go back to what Ferenzi did in 1244. We need to activate the community resiliency and make it part of digital health. So um, to do this, you have to go now to crowdsourcing. So I'll just give you a quick uh, round about card sourcing, card sensing, is where people uh, present it in their smartphones are able to receive tasks and get data and get actions done. Um, basically, you have to first create a task and then select your, uh, your workers, it's called worker selection, and then do execution and, uh, and finish the job. This trend has been rising. We all know Uber, that is the first example, but it's not just Uber. Entire food delivery industry has transformed. In China, no one, no company will ever, no restaurant will hire a delivery person. Delivery person is all crowdsourced in China. So if you happen to be in the area between the food source and the food delivery, uh, and you have the app, you will, your phone will ring again, you pick the job, you take it, you deliver. So the entire industry has transformed. Uh, bike, shared bike is also transformed. If you do shared bike, it doesn't work because people take the bike from one point A and drop it on point B. So the, way, the clever way of doing it is to, to, to do crowdsourcing. So you tell people, you are here, and this is the nearest bike, but if you go to that bike, and instead of this bike, um, I'll give you 15% discount. Then you go here and you drop it there. Then you are doing the balancing of the bike. That's, that's a crowdsourcing. And it has, usually has a budget that you spend to achieve a goal. So the same thing now we need to tab on. We need to have crowdsourcing platform in any community so we're able to have this Uber app, the digital health Uber app, and the community does a lot of things. The question becomes, what do doctors and nurses want? If you take the string, the string of care, what element of that string of care that can be done by the community? That analysis is very critical. I'm working with several colleagues to find out the parts that need to be done uh, in that fashion. I think I'm going to wrap up here quickly. <clears throat> Some concern, as I said, it's not like a, 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 an Uber driver is different. So we, we, we have challenges as far as reputation management and skill training. 
uh, that's critical, privacy, and also the fact that sometimes you need multi-expertise. In other words, there will be time to deliver a service. You need two drivers, if we can call them drivers, together. Because someone can be trained on how to take a person from the bed into the car. That requires, that's a whole different area. And when somebody is driving or somebody is doing something else. So it might involve multiple workers in the same crowdsourcing transaction. OK, here's my conclusion. Let us exploit services to a great societal benefit and impact. Healthy people, healthy communities, and healthy nations. Services has a room to, to play here. So uh, uh, it's not just the health IT, but it's just a process, the health process itself. So let's exploit services. Microservices could enable and shape health IoT technology. Microservices could enable the Uber of digital health for community engagement and potentially uh, uh, start up a microservices economy. Because remember, these people who are participating will make money. When you retire, you lose money, and you, you scale down, and you go to a community. That may be a great idea to, to create a flow of an economy where people still continue to make some money and spend time feeling purposeful. They're doing something good. Let's work on digital health advancement together through IEEE Congress on Services. I hope I see more digital health content uh, next year and the years to come. So I'll stop here and uh, take questions if you have.